Shout outs this week to some PRSSA members. If you're not familiar with PRSSA, there's the Public Relations Society of America, and then there's the student version of it called the Public Relations Student Society of America. And we have an increasing number of listeners that are PRSSA members. So shout outs this week to Ashley from Green Bay, Wisconsin, Andrew from Chicago, Illinois, and Kate from Minneapolis, Minnesota, all PRSSA members, and thank you for listening. Well, if you haven't noticed by now, it's an election year. At the Shaping Opinion podcast, we had a decision to make. Try to give an alternative to the nonstop election coverage that you're seeing and give perspectives through the Shaping Opinion lens. We decided to do both. When we can, we'll give you some insights that you may not find in other places on how people respond to the strategies, tactics, and messages of political campaigns. Other times, we'll continue to give you conversations that have nothing to do with politics and escape, if you will, from all that you may be seeing on television or online. If you have any thoughts or feedback, send them to me through email at tim at shapingopinion.com. If it's easier for you, get in touch on Twitter or Instagram at Shaping Opinion. If you want, we can give you a shout out. And as always, thank you for being a listener of the Shaping Opinion podcast. You're the reason we do this. This is Shaping Opinion, a production of O'Brien Communications. As a voter, how do you prepare for an election? Uh, that's a good question. Not well enough. I, I feel bad about this because uh, because I feel that I'm in a position in which I should be better informed about about politics, and uh, and it should be you know it's it's I think it's it's not necessarily individually rational to spend a lot of time uh, being interested in politics, but it's certainly a good contribution to the to the common good. And so I feel a bit bad that I'm not more interested. So I do what what I think most people do, which is I rely on on friends and colleagues who are who kind of follow politics more closely than I do. And um, and you know between them and in your kind of newspapers, um, that usually gives me a good a good opinion of the lay of the land and what decision would would seem like the most you know the the best for the for the for the country or, or you know, for us. I mean, one of my kind of foibles is that I spend much more time following American politics uh, than French politics, uh, partly because it feels like as if the stakes were, you know, the stakes are much larger. I don't know if it's an illusion or not, but um, it's certainly more you know, entertaining for good and bad reasons to follow American politics than French politics. <laughs> so, yes, unfortunately, so I spend more time like following the, the current the primaries now than, uh, well, I guess there's nothing going on. In, I mean, you know, there's... Obviously, things going on in France, but there are no major elections going on now. So, but even as a rule, I would I would I would follow more closely um, U.S. politics than French politics. I'm Tim O'Brien. In this episode of the Shaping Opinion podcast, we're joined by Hugo Mercier. He's a cognitive scientist and the author of the book, Not Born Yesterday, The Science of Who We Trust and What We Believe. The premise of our podcast is simple. We talk about people, events, and things that have shaped the way we think. Today, we'll talk with Hugo about a question that he raised in the Wall Street Journal recently. Do political campaigns change voters' minds? It's 2020 and election season is in full swing. No matter where you live in America, you're starting to see the ads, the debates, door-to-door canvassers, political signs, the rallies, the protests. While some of what you see may be genuine and spontaneous, much of what you see is crafted as part of a political campaign designed to change your mind. Hugo Mercier is a cognitive scientist at the Jean Nico Institute in Paris. He recently wrote the book, Not Born Yesterday, The Science of Who We Trust and What We Believe. But it was something he wrote in the Wall Street Journal recently that prompted us to reach out to him. He wrote a column posing the question, do political campaigns change voters' minds? So it's part of a... So essentially, I started being interested in this uh, a long time ago. And the the broad topic is how easy are people to influence and to to persuade. And um, and a while ago, uh, with Dan Sperber, my former uh, PhD advisor, and and a bunch of other colleagues, we wrote a paper in which we argued that 
from an evolutionary point of view, it makes no sense for people to be to be gullible, to be easy to influence, to influence, because essentially, you know, you can imagine if some of our ancestors, uh, you know, had been too easy to influence, well, you know, they would have been, you know, lied to, they would have been manipulated, and they, you know, they wouldn't be our ancestors. And so we know from from evolutionary biology and evolutionary theory that communication in in any species has to be mostly reliable. That is, you know, you can't just have communication in which one end just always ends up getting getting, getting screwed over because that's just not stable. And so we developed this kind of sort of theoretical argument suggesting that, well, you know, in fact, humans, um, like, you know, other species that rely on communication, um, should be quite good at telling when they should listen to others and when they shouldn't. And whenever I would I would talk to people about that, um, I would always get reactions saying, "Oh no, you know people are people are gullible. You know you can see that in advertising, in political campaigns, in in propaganda, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. And so that just prompted me to to look into all these examples that people or the kind of these these uh, supposed counter examples that people would give me. And every time I found out that in fact uh, persuasion in in every one of these domains was much, much, much harder uh, than people thought it was. And on the whole, people, and in, really kind of academics, except, you know, specialists, but uh, most academics included, people suffer from what is called as the, the third-person effect. So everybody believes that they're not gullible, that it's, you know, no one believes that they're easily influenced by, you know, by what they, by the, by the ads they see on Facebook or on TV or, you know, by political campaigns. But most people believe other people are easy to influence. You mentioned that people aren't, they, they don't see themselves as easily influenced, but they will admit to who they trust, and they may admit that somebody that they trust changed their mind. So I have a question for you about trust. What is the relationship between the concept of trust and effective communication? Well, it's crucial. So essentially, the first reaction people have when you tell them something, uh, I think, is based on the content of what you tell them. And if it's something that doesn't resonate with what they already believe, if it doesn't fit with what they already believe, their first reaction will be to reject whatever you're telling them. And then there are kind of two broad categories of, of factors that can overcome this initial resistance. Uh, one is if you give them good arguments, and the other is if they if they trust you, both if that, in that they trust you as being someone who is competent, someone who is an expert, someone who has um, relevant information, and if they trust you as being someone who who has their interests at heart, so arguments are arguments can work well on their own. If you're you know if you're looking at mathematics or logic, you know if someone could be a complete crook, but if they give you a, a very good mathematical argument, you can have no choice but to but to listen to it. But in most domains, even arguments end up relying on trust. Now, let's say if you want to to convince someone that you know vaccines are safe, you can tell them, well, look, you know here is a study, here is another study, here is what the doctor says. And um, but for all of these, they have to trust you. They have to trust you that these studies are real. They have to trust the people who've run the studies that they were run correctly, etc. And so at the end, every time you want to change someone's mind, not just to tell them something they would agree with um, spontaneously, every time you want to change someone's mind, and except in these kind of rare domains in which pure argumentation works, like like logic or mathematics, you need trust. You need you need them to trust you um, to to change their minds. Let's look at the political arena and talk about this issue of trust. When I see a candidate or when I see a number of candidates, in a, and I'm an American and I'm used to politicians being politicians, I don't necessarily trust any of them. But, and I, this is addressed in some of your research, if a friend of mine says they're voting for candidate A or candidate B, I place my trust in my friend or somebody that I respect and has a lot of credibility with me. So my question for you then is, when we place trust in someone else for voting, are we more likely to place trust in a friend who recommends a candidate, or do we trust the candidate themselves? So both can happen. Both can happen. Um, so clearly people use, I mean, as, I was, as I was saying in relation with my kind of my own um, strategy and what you're describing as well in, in, in your own case, people do look at their, you know, their friends and their colleagues and their family members, people they trust um, for information about politics. And on the whole, there's research suggesting, uh, so not only that, that people indeed you know, do that, but that they seem to be doing it appropriately enough in that they tend to trust more people who do have more political knowledge, for instance. So it's not, you know, just at random. It's uh, There seems to be a 
some discrimination in who people trust in that respect. In the same way as, you know, you kind of know which one, which of your friends you should ask for computer advice or car advice or you kind know, of house repairs advice. Um, so in, in politics as well, we tend to be uh, discriminative, um, discriminant in that in that in that respect. And clearly, that's very powerful because, as you are saying, um, you know, we know that some of our friends are, are kind of more uh, involved in politics, and we you know we trust that they are not trying to swindle us. And by contrast, we know that politicians are, you know, to some extent, uh, obviously self-interested. But people also do trust politicians or political parties to the extent that they feel as if they represent their opinions. So not necessarily their, you know, their financial interests. So we know we know that people don't vote only based on on their financial interests. But for instance, not every rich person vote for Republicans because they expect tax cuts. Uh, on the whole, you know, rich people tend to vote more Republican. But it's not, you know, the, the match is far from being perfect. So we know that people don't only vote for their financial interests. But on the whole, people do play some, people seem to place some trust in politicians and political parties that they feel represent their opinions. And then when some trust has been gained, so when, you know, when you're a, politi a political party, a politician, and you have represented people's views for, for a long time, and then when you take a stance on, on, a, on a topic that is kind of obscure, and that most people don't have a strong opinion about, then people will listen to you. So you know, if you're if you're you know a fervent uh, Republican, let's say, and if uh, I don't know, well, you know, it's a weird example, right? Being a weird Republican, but um, you know, if you, if you're a Republican and you and you know, let's say you, you really kind of respect Mitt Romney, and Mitt Romney takes a position on an obscure trade deal, um, you're likely to to believe that he's right because you have no opinion, and you kind of respect his his opinions on the whole. So both both. Uh, both kind of the, the kind of using friends strategy and directly trusting politician strategy um, apply in some cases depending on on the on the people. Well, that actually brings me to the issue of politics and some of the things that you write about and that you wrote about in the Wall Street Journal. And I found some of the things that you mentioned right up front very compelling. In 2020, at least $6 billion will be spent on political campaigns in the United States, and over $2 billion of that will be spent on the presidential race. And when you talk about campaigns, you're talking about TV ads, cold calling, mailings, social media, and more sophisticated technology that uses big data. So my question there is, just from the outset, if we believe that all of that does influence an election, how does that all work to change voters' minds, at least in the minds of the people who believe in it? I don't know. I don't know why people believe it works. Um, I guess there is a variety of reasons. Um, one of them is that it's a convenient way of explaining a lot of disagreements. So, you know, let's say if you're if you're a Democrat and you realize that, you know, nearly half of the country uh, disagrees with you on a variety of issues and you think that their views are you know, kind of very kind of, you know, ill-informed and, and offensive and whatnot, it's easier, in a way, to to reconcile the fact that these millions of these millions of people are disagreeing with you, if you believe they've all been been brainwashed by by Fox News, uh, rather than if you think they've kind of independently reached these these conclusions that you, uh, that you object to. Um, so that may be one of the reasons uh, why people believe that. Another reason, obviously, is that people have something to sell. You know, people who design political campaigns, people who run ads. Um, you know, they have jobs uh, on the line. They're kind of happy for people to believe that. Campaign managers want to be, they want to be seen as doing something. So there's a variety of reasons for, for these things to, to continue, even, even if their effectiveness is, uh, is debatable. And debatable seems to be an understatement based on the research that you have. Uh, you, you had, uh, according to your work, for almost 20 years, political scientists have studied the effectiveness of political campaigns and just as you wrote, they wanted to find out whether a campaign strategy actually works. Tell us what they found. What they found essentially is that in, in all of the experiments, the effects are very, very small. So the way they do it usually is they uh, they would something like I don't know, akin to, uh, to a randomized control trial. So for instance, in half of the electoral districts in a, in a town or in a, in a state, you will send out flyers or you will do robocalling or you will do, um, you will do um, you know, canvassing. And in the other half, you do nothing. And then you see if the people in the, in the half of the districts you've covered are more likely to vote for the candidate you are, you are pushing for. And the studies that have used uh, these kind of techniques, um, I found that on the whole, the effects are very small uh, or non-existent. So it's very, 
So it depends on the election. So in general elections, the effects are always, nearly always um, zero. And one reason is that people already have a lot of information about the candidates, and so there's gonna, their minds tend to be quite set. Um, the effects are a bit more important, like they're just like non-zero, they're still very small, but they're non-zero, or they can be non-zero in like primary elections or ballot measures, because in these elections, um, people don't have, they can't rely on the heuristic of you know, voting for the Republican or voting for the Democrat. And so if you have a choice between five Democrats and you know if you don't follow politics much and they all look similar to you, then it's you're more you're kind of easier to influence, um, and and the thing one of the one of the advantages of this strategy of this of this uh, kind of methodology of, of using kind of randomized um, um, uh, something like a randomized control trial is that it controls for the fact that political campaigns are strategic. So let's say if you're you know if I'm if I'm like Clinton's campaign, I'm going to spend such amount of money in some in some some such states some such states, then maybe Trump campaign will the Trump campaign will decide to spend. Um, you know, an equivalent amount of, amount of money in the same states. And people could think, well, it looks as if there is no overall effect of the campaigns, but it's only because they're, they're kind of counteracting each other. And we know from these randomized control trials that it's not the case because the other campaign isn't, you know, at random pushing for the opposite candidate in half of the districts. So, um, so these studies are pretty neat. And on the whole, their results are convergent. So what we don't have is we don't have a study in which you would randomize a whole campaign. So, you know, for like the whole Clinton campaign would only be on half of the district in a town or something, because obviously, you know, they wouldn't, they wouldn't, you know, let us do that. So we don't know, we, we can only generalize from studies in which, you know, if you look at one event of canvassing or robocalling or something, we know that individually they don't do much or anything, but it's, you know, it's possible that in the aggregate, they still have some, some small effect. Well, you mentioned that some of this research was done, and it all seems to have started from Yale University. There were some researchers at Yale University, and you had mentioned that they did randomized studies that actually conflicted with each other. So some other people came along years later and consolidated their research and looked at it from a more big picture point of view. How did that process work? In one of the first studies uh, on that topic already, um, Alan Gerber from, from, from Yale indeed had uh, he had done a number of studies, and some of them seemed to show that uh, there were no effects. Some of them seemed to show that there was a large, and large enough effect of the of the campaigning. Others that the effect was negative. And then, as people were kind of pining on more studies, the results kept kept being a bit a bit conflicted. And so, um, uh, recently, um, Josh Josh Kalla and, and David Brookman have done what what is called a meta analysis. So they've taken all the existing studies. And they've kind of aggregated them and tried to find kind of the overall patterns that would come out if you look at everything together. Um, so they have uh, nearly 50 studies of, of this type, and that's that is kind of that meta-analysis that leads to the conclusion that in uh, in general elections the effects are very very small, if if any, and that it's only in um, in, in elections like primaries or ballot measures that uh, you start seeing some effects of political campaigns. So basically, they found that the campaign strategies work locally in primaries, but not necessarily at the federal level. And you said that they had added nine of their own studies to the whole mix of the aggregate that they studied. Yes, and and it's, a, it's mostly a matter of information. So the more information people have in the first place through the media, through, through you know, as, as we're saying, through personal acquaintances, um, the less susceptible they will be to, uh, to information provided by political campaigns. So if you're in a very local election and you, and you don't know who the candidates are at all, you don't know what the election is about, uh, then you're more likely to be to be swayed by any information you receive, whether it is from from a political campaign or from or from something else. And so, but obviously, because you know the most important elections are, we know at, at least the most kind of visible elections are the, are the presidential elections, and that's where most of the money is being spent, um, and that's where it's likely the least useful. So, to some extent, I, I believe I'm not sure on this, but. I believe Republicans have tended to maybe diversify a bit more and to and to spend more money and to invest themselves more in in local elections and indeed they they control the majority of, of legislators of state legislators and it's probably a, a strategically sense way of proceeding. Why is it that campaign strategies tend to work better at the primary level or the local level? Because people have have less information, and so you have there is more room to to change their minds by providing providing them with more information. 
American voters are increasingly well informed. I mean, they're still people are still very poorly informed about politics on the whole, but they're but they're increasingly well informed. So people are increasingly able to tell that you know that Donald Trump has such and such view, and that Hillary Clinton had such and such views, you know, before the before the last election. But that's true mostly at the at the at the federal level for the kind of general elections. At the more local level, people are still most people still have very little information. And that means that when you inform people about um, candidates' positions, you can still get them to change their minds a little bit, you know, because you can make them realize that such and such candidate actually has views that, that fits with their, with their own views. If people are more informed at the federal level, where are they getting their information? Where, where are they getting that information? Well, mostly from the media and, and also from, from kind of word of mouth, as, as, as we were saying earlier. So there's uh, quite a big literature in, in political science um, that started in the, in the 50s on, on the two-step flow. So this idea that a lot of information about politics is relayed through more informed um, um, citizens. And so you'd have you know, the media and political campaigns that relay information to these citizens who are you know, kind of more actively involved in politics or kind of more interested in it. And then these people will relay the information to, um, to others and sometimes you have you know, another step, et cetera. But at least that a lot of information goes through kind of one layer of, of citizens before reaching uh, most citizens. And that's where people get information from. Mostly it's from, it's from the media. And so we, we know that another way of, of seeing that is, for instance, there has been very you know, interesting studies suggesting that the death of local media, typically of local newspapers, is, is really bad because it allows for more corruption. Because essentially people then have less information about local candidates that are not or local local politicians that are not covered in, in national newspapers and as a result politicians are able to be more corrupt because you know if you're less likely to be found out to be reported on and so that's a problem too. i mean obviously it's, it's good that people are more informed about politics on the whole but people should be proportionally probably more in, more interested in local politics than in national politics. And then again, I'm not following that detail myself at all, so I feel bad telling others what they should do. But in theory, um, that would probably be, be wiser. I thought it was interesting in your, in your article that you talk about how information is shared locally or not. And if I'm looking at a, at a local politician or a primary race involving even a federal politician like a congressman, there are certain issues that are sort of minutia to me if I'm a local voter. So if I'm a local voter and I see that on the ballot is the town council is looking at a new uh, local tax increase and it has something to do with, let's say, our water system or our infrastructure and paying for upgrades. Well, that's too complicated for me. I don't really want to read much about that. So I'm not paying attention to, to that issue. So I don't pay attention to it. So when it's time for me to go vote, I may really not know the issues at that local level, as you pointed out. But I do know this politician is a Republican or a Democrat, and I'm a Democrat or a Republican, so I'm going to vote for that person just because of the party affiliation, which I trust. Is that pretty much a good description of what you wrote about? Yes, there's a lot of that. Uh, people rely on party cues, and and that's why you know getting the endorsement, the endorsement from one of the you know Democrats or the Republicans is such a such a crucial thing for any politician. You know, beat at the, at the national like no no third party candidate has any has, you know, has ever really done anything uh, decent, and so getting their endorsement is crucial because most people. I rely on that heuristic, and that's true even at the national level where people have more information about the candidates. It's still true that you know whoever is, is going is going to be the Republican nominee is going to have you know 40 or 45 percent of the votes just by virtue of being the Republican nominee. And we can see, I think, with Donald Trump that even someone who has you know what might charitably say has many flaws um, that would have been damning maybe in context, just being the Republican nominee means well. Most people, I mean, a lot of people are, you know, who would have voted for a Republican are going to vote for him it's because they trust that he will continue, um, you know, he will pursue the kind of policies that he can typically pursue. Well, one of the things that you wrote about, too, was the comparison between traditional methods of marketing and promoting and campaigning. And you mentioned that snail mail and landlines were used in a lot of the earlier studies. And you, you raised a question of whether those studies are relevant because the Internet is the future. 
that online campaigns can buy data by the carload, as you said, to better aim their targeted messages at the right people. How would you describe the role that online and digital media will play going forward, and, and will it change? At the national level, my bet is that it's not going to change much because people, as we're saying, are so kind of impervious to persuasion at that level because then again, you know, they already have a lot of information. And so getting a bit more through through social media is unlikely to, uh, to be different. There's, there's less data on that. There's, there are some, some of the studies I mentioned earlier that the effects of political campaigns were done with online ads and, and the results were the same, that these ads were no, not effective at all. So I doubt that it will change much. Obviously, there are many other kind of worries about social media and everything. But I think to some extent, they relate more to the fact that they need to hurt local media. Like the, what I was mentioning, that the, the death of local newspapers is really bad for is really bad for, for you know for everyone. And um, and it's possible that social media will uh, will accelerate that by kind of highlighting visually missing some national newspapers and from national sources. There's one thing that I notice in my own work, and we do work with traditional means and also digital means. And the one thing that I've always had to remind other people when I've talked to them is that human nature doesn't change. That whether they're reading something in a physical newspaper or they're reading something online, what really matters to them is, to your earlier point, who they trust, what they trust, if the messaging resonates with their predispositions, their values, all of those things go into play, whether they're looking at it online or they're reading it from a newspaper or watching it on television. Human nature doesn't change. But to your other point, social media can accelerate the speed with which communication can happen. Is that an issue, the, the speed of communication? And do you think future studies will look at that? Um, it is I mean, obviously it is an issue for for you know, journalists who uh, who um, I, I, I guess are under pressure to react more quickly maybe you know before they had they've had time to to do more thorough checks or to you know to do kind of more in depth reporting. So I'm sure I mean I would say many journalists would would you know would have preferred to work when things were a bit slower when they would have more time to put more thoughts into into whatever they were writing than we really have to. To, to talk about the you know whatever is is the, in the news cycle right away because you know in 24 hours the news cycle will be will be talking about something else. Um, so I guess that's it's a problem in that respect. Obviously, in other respects, you know, it's, it's good to have information quickly. That you know, obviously, I guess you can see that with the with the current uh, um, outbreak, uh, epidemic outbreak in China. That you know, it's good people are informed about these things. They can, you know, to some extent, people are even you know, like specialists and scientists, and, and can can communicate faster and more easily. And so, so speed on the whole is probably maybe I guess a good thing, but clearly a lot of, of drawbacks as well. Well, you mentioned a study earlier, Brookman and Kellia, and they found this in 2016 that I thought was interesting, and it was a different study, but it's one that they published in the journal Science, and you describe it this way. You said that canvassers engaged people in 10-minute conversations on an issue that was around transgender rights in that case. They offered information and arguments and asked voters to remember a time when they had been judged negatively for being different. So. What they did there in that case was analyze a very sensitive issue where people were sort of dug in on their positions. And then canvassers had 10 minute conversations with people and there was a different outcome. How, how did that study work? So they did, in, in a way, kind of similar to the, the studies I mentioned earlier. So they selected uh, uh, an area in, in California. I think it's in California anyway. And in half of the, they selected in a half of the, of the kind of houses in that area to canvas, and the other half they, um, I don't remember if they canvas, but just on a different topic, or if they, or if they only sent um, um, kind of questionnaires. But so in, in half of the places, they had this person who would, people would have this person who would talk to them about uh, transgender's rights uh, in relation with the with the bill that was going to be uh, voted on, or maybe a referendum even. And then, you know, as you are saying, there was this kind of this 10 minute conversation in which you know, people, it was to some extent open, people could talk about what they wanted. But one of the strategies that the canvassers used, as you said, was to try to get people to empathize with uh, transgender people by, you know, recalling a time in which they had been in the, in the, in the kind of on the receiving end of, of discrimination. 
And what they found was that this intervention, in a 10 minute intervention, 10 minute conversation is a pretty short thing, it's a pretty small thing, but it did have an effect on, on people's attitudes towards uh, transgenders and it, it, you know, it made them more positive. So the effect, it's not, you know, it's not massive, but then again, it's only a 10 minute conversation. Uh, but what was interesting is that it was, it was long lasting. So three months after, this change was still there. So it, it seems as if, and one of the things that, that, that that's interesting is that it suggests that if you repeat this kind of interventions, I mean, not necessarily, you know, by having actually someone go to, to, to other people's door to door, but, you know, when people talk to each other, they can change people's minds. So you know, maybe when you when you talk to your, you know, your friends and your colleagues and your family, it feels as if you're having no effect because, well, partly because the changes are, are pretty small and partly because sometimes people you know, just refuse to admit that they were wrong when they were, you know, they want to save face when they're having the discussion. But in fact, you're still kind of having an effect that people realize after the fact, and they kind of, they slowly can come, could come to um, to change their minds. So I think it, it's a reason for optimism that in the long run, uh, people's attitudes can change if we, you know, if they're being confronted in a way that is kind of smart and uh, not too kind of antagonistic. You said that they went back a few months later and found out that the uh, earlier intervention, as you mentioned, had an effect that was longer lasting. How did they know that three months later? Did they do a follow-up study? Yes, it, they just they 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 sent people the same questionnaires that they had uh, the first time around. Uh, so obviously, you have kind of problems with problems of, of attrition. So the more you do this, the you know fewer people will reply three months later than than at first. But they have ways of controlling for this, and and um, and on the whole, it seems as if the effect was uh, was long lasting. Well, if I were a politician and I read this, it would be very intriguing to me that a 10 minute conversation by a canvasser could change someone's mind. But in the back of my mind, if I'm a campaigner, I would say, well, I can't do that to scale. If you want to persuade millions of people, you can't necessarily have millions of 10 minute conversations. Uh, is there any way to scale something like that? So uh, not really. <laughs> yes. It's, it's not the, the issue with these, with these conversations is say if someone is, is being kind of prejudiced against uh, transgender people, it might be because they've had one experience or they've, they've read one particular argument or they've, you know, they've misinformed in, in one particular dimension. And you can address this specific thing. You can tell, well, no, this is wrong or, you know, here is a counter example, et cetera. And this, this back and forth of conversation is what makes um, discussions very effective is that you can really pinpoint exactly why people disagree with you and, and address these specific counter arguments. And so, and that is very hard to scale in a, you know, to get an army of canvasser, you'd be, you know, fantastically um, expensive. And also people have to be kind of, you know, they have to be empathetic enough to understand where the other person is coming from. They have to be well informed enough to be able to counter the, their arguments. It's, it's, it's hard. But uh, in a more kind of organic manner, um, the fact that, you know, people talk to each other, they can influence each other in, in that way. So you, that's, you know, for instance, when uh, when you had big social movements like you know, feminism or you know the, the civil rights, people were talking about these these issues a lot, and all of these discussions that were not you know controlled by by, by a political party that were more you know organically um, evolving must have had an I mean, you know, I want to believe had an effect and and the kind of studies we we mentioned suggest that they 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 would have had a, they would have had an effect. Hugo Mercier, thank you for joining us today. Well, thank you very much for having me, Tim. It was a pleasure. To learn more about Hugo Mercier and everything that we talked about today, please see our show notes at shapingopinion.com. If you enjoyed this episode, please help others find it. Leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts and subscribe wherever you listen to your podcast. We'd love to hear from you. On Twitter, just tweet to us at Shaping Opinion. Or you can get in touch with us through our website, shapingopinion.com. We have a Facebook page and we're on Instagram at Shaping Opinion. Shaping Opinion is a production of O'Brien Communications. This is where we talk about people, events, and things that have shaped the way we think. Until next time, I'm Tim O'Brien. Thank you.